Hey, everybody. Welcome to Oregon State University's Permaculture Design Pro course. This is the fall and winter 2022-2023 course, and we are on our sixth office hour, and Sheena and I are going to go over, I think, some of her assignment. Take it away. All right. Um, yes, I was just mentioning that um, it was a very enlightening assignment, and once again, um, I've learned a lot, and I've discovered this week that Turns out my soil quality is really bad. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's very sandy, hmm. um, which is not unexpected because we're on glacial till. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like the the one test that I did for the the percolation test, you know, it was like wait thirty minutes, wait an hour. I waited fifteen minutes in the hole of empty. So yeah, so good infiltration and good drainage. Yes, good drainage. So it's great for my septic system. Um, not so great for my garden. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I did I did a separate test in the like sort of existing vegetable garden, which is fenced off and it's been established, I think, for quite some time. Um, it's not quite as sandy. Mm -hmm. um, oh, here comes Daniel. Great. Um, there's no clay, at least in right. that part. Um, so it's like it was 65% sand, 35% silt mm -hmm. um, and I'm actually in the process of overhauling the whole thing with raised beds okay so you know it's going to be a big you know I've got like 15 raised beds so it's not right all. um I have to bring in like two truckloads probably of compost um and I'm also going to do sort of the, the hugel culture style so I am going to just fill the bottom I have tons of logs and branches and stuff lying around the property so I'm just going to fill the bottom of the beds with that and then in hopes of needing only half of the compost nice okay um, yeah and then the other thing is um again lots of woody and veg vegetation uh on my property so i can make my own compost all right so that's kind of the the goal here okay. over the next year or so is to really kind of get that going awesome yeah okay so are you looking for input on that as an idea or remediations for soil or what are yeah, you thinking? Probably some reme remediations for soil, particularly. So my third soil test was down towards, I don't know if you recall the layout of my property, but hmm. um, like to closest towards the water is just this lawn. And the soil hmm. there was actually quite strange. It did have some clay in it, mm -hmm. but it still drained relatively quickly. Um, and that was where we were hoping to plant um, some fruit trees. So the, the one thing that I did learn in researching the, um, I forget what they called it, like agricultural sort of classification of our soil, it's a class five, which is bad for growing like any perennial crop, but it does say that if you have the climate for growing grapes or fruit trees, you should be okay. So that was somewhat encouraging. <laughs> So yeah, there's there's a couple of great things about well-draining soil, and one of them is fruit trees and a number of vines. So anything that's generally predominantly in a, an arid or a Mediterranean client, climate mm -hmm. um, has a similar type of soil. Now, it may not have the same climate. So mm -hmm. things like apples usually do really well. Things like grapes do really well. Anything that, that likes dry feet. So there's a lot of fruit trees that will not tolerate wet feet at all. Um, and they'll die out. And those are the, those are the clay soils and the silt soils and things like that. So I think in your situation, most of your uh, perennials and um, your trees should do really well. And one of the things that we've done before is, and I, I piloted this, I think it's going on about eight or nine years. Um, we did a design on the West Coast of British Columbia on Galliano Island. Um, it's on my website, allpointsdesign.ca uh, forward slash portfolio. It's called the pilot food forest or food forest pilot. But basically we did a hygge culture and it was a, a decent slope. So it was a hygge culture and then it was a bed. And basically what we did is we put the trees on the down slope of the hygge culture. Okay. So that way they could grow into the hygge culture and find moisture. Had we put them on the upslope because of the amount of moisture that area received, which I think was close to like 13 or 1400 millimeters, they would have drowned out. They just would have soaked up because of the, the topography of the landscape. So what I would probably do in your situation is if you can incorporate something like a hugel culture, and maybe it's not a raised hugel, like maybe it's a, 
Basically, right. Hoogles will lose 40% of their value over the years. So if you if you size it appropriately and just do the math and go, okay, if it drops 40%, it'll be a slightly raised mound and then put your trees on one side or the other, then that would help to create some in-ground um, water holding capacity. But okay. be conscientious, you never plant any perennials that are woody into a hoop culture. You always plant them on the side because it loses all of that height. If you put a if you put a tree onto it and it starts to lose its height and its its volume, they'll topple over because they need to find good footing in okay. soil. So I would say that's probably a good idea. I think your idea about putting or, or lining the bottom of your raised beds with hookah culture is great. The other option you could work with, two other options actually. One is depending on where your water flow is off your roof, you may have the opportunity to run um a downspout and then run big o perforated pipe this is used in landscaping it's three five six inch it's black and corrugated and it can be slitted it can be perforated or unperforated and it usually comes with a big sock that goes over it so that way roots can't get into it okay. you can put that into the top third of the raised bed and now you can allow the water that's coming off of your roof to actually percolate through your raised beds i just um, I just designed this for my father actually a couple of years ago and he installed it and it's working brilliantly well. So he's taking half of his roof. It's then going through a probably close to 45 foot bed. And that's the predominant water that that, that bed will receive. So you can okay. go that way, or you could do what's called wicking beds and wicking beds are done in such a way that the bottom is lined with something. So that way it becomes a repository for water. And then you have something that creates a, a shelf in which you put on your soil. And then you have little wicks of soil that go down into that. And then that water then wicks up into the bed. And this can be very useful for people who uh, have problems in arid environments or have problems with maintenance. Um, if there's issues with maintenance, these can be great ways of doing this. And you can either create it in such a way that you have a structure like a wooden structure and then you line it or which is easier, but not necessarily cheaper. You can buy large um, stainless steel horse troughs because they already have a bung to them. They're already watertight. And then you can build them out. There's a video on my YouTube, two videos on my YouTube channel describing how to create wicking beds. And the cool thing about wicking beds is that if you're on level ground and you have many, as you were talking about, you can plumb them together and then have little passover. So if you've got two beds and then like a little um, a little plumb, a little piece of pipe that's keeping them all basically as one large tank. So say you have 10 or 12, there was an assignment last semester and the person's name was Noah Crowell or Cole. You'll, it'll be in the examples on that very first slide. But he presented these these raised beds. And what we did is I advised him to plumb them all together because it was on a dead level slope. And now all he had to do was, was fill up one bed and then have like a little spigot that comes up to show the level. And he could fill every single bed at the same time. Cause normally what happens is you've got a single pipe that comes up from the bottom and you have to fill each one of the, the different beds, but doing it this way, you can just fill one bed and it works out really well. The other option to do it there is to do what's called a fill tank. And so you have a separate tank, like an IVC tote or something, something that you can plumb in a, fl a float valve, the same thing that's in your toilet. And basically when you set it, you're setting it for the entire group. And then you just have an active water line that comes to that, that automatically fills all the bed. I did this for a client, I think the second year I was involved in permaculture and we used five gallon buckets and we plumbed them together because originally this concept I don't know if it's originally, but it was popularized by a couple of 14 year old kids who created the system called the global buckets, which is basically you grab two five gallon buckets, you put them together, you put like a, I think it was a number one or, or 0.5 pot in the bottom, waters in the bottom bucket, soils in the top bucket, and then they grew um, tomatoes and, and, and all of these, these um, uh, nightshades. Uh, and the great thing was, is that they were portable. So because they were working a lot on asphalt or pavement, they could, you know, move things around. So I would say between those, you'll find a spectrum of things to work with. And you may, you may want to, in year one, create one of each and just 
explore, experience and explore them for year one or year two and go, okay, which one do I like? Which one was the cost? You know, what was the cost of it? How, how has the maintenance been? And then use that as a nucleated design to then decide, okay, what do I want to do for the entire area? So how would you compare, like those systems definitely sound a lot different than like a, what I would say is a traditional sort of irrigation system mm -hmm. using, you know, drip tubing and yeah. which is kind of what I was planning to put in because that's what I know. Yeah. Um, so the difference is, is that bottom up water always creates stronger plants. And that's a, that's one of those period full stops. We can, we know this, there's been so many studies on it that we know that it's the case. So if you can have bottom up watering or as watering normally is it comes from the rain comes from the sky comes down soaks in and what happens is if there's water around a plant root the plant will seek out that water and especially if it's low the plant will seek out that water below okay and that'll create very strong roots it'll create a robust three-dimensional version of those plant roots that will uh that will actively seek out nutrition that will make relationships with fung fungi and bacteria and start to create relationships with the other trophic levels of the soil food web. So all of that creates a really phenomenal growing zone. And you can put mulch on top without worry because you're not overhead watering. So you can put in, you know, two inches, three inches, four inches of mulch, depending on the plants. Um, and that will stop effectively all of apotranspiration that comes from the soil. So effectively you have a closed watering system. If you work with, um, drip irrigation or irrigation overhead spray sprinkler sprays things of that nature what ends up happening is you especially with sprays is you lose a lot of of water to evapotranspiration it's not directed exactly to where you want it if you go with drip it's directed but um, the emitters are only so well placed and spaced right so mm -hmm. you'll have wetting zones and if there isn't enough coverage there'll be issues and if you don't get the timing right there'll be issues as well so one of the things I really like about hula culture and I really like about wicking beds is that if done correctly, it basically wicks the water up to the bottom third to 40% of the soil profile. And then the plants reach down to find it and they do really phenomenally well. So I created, I don't know if I've talked about it in this class, um, I created what's called this big E hula culture. And if you go back through the previous office hours, it's even listed in the, the title. And the biggie hygge culture was basically off of my shop, which I think I calculated as 30,000 liters off the shop and 30,000 liters on the garden. I made this big E trench. So that way the drip edge of the shop came to sort of the tine of the E. And then I made these three uh, hygge cultures that came off of it that were big mounds. And basically I had enough water coming into the hygge culture that during our hottest summer where we had a heat dome where I got to 53 degrees centigrade and I'll go and do the math to Fahrenheit. It's something crazy like 127 or 128. Um, we grew all of our own squash and I didn't water at once because that water was down below. It had a whole season to charge. And now I was growing perennial or annuals. But the great thing about these hookah cultures in particular, and you could do hookah cultures with wicking beds as well. There's no reason why you can't is that the, the wood basically breaks down into organic matter and now you increase the water holding capacity of your soils because you increase the surface area because when wood breaks down, it has an incredible amount of surface area to it. Plus, um, there's the millennia of co-evolution between the soil food web that, you know, when you go into a forest and you see a nurse tree that's fallen down, it's just teeming with life. So you could you could work with both. And typically in year one, you have to do a little bit of watering with things like culture. You don't with wicking beds. But if you did both, if you did a wicking bed that had soil that came into those wicks, and then you had pieces of wood that were scattered throughout the main body of the bed, and then you topped with soil or compost, that would probably be the, the, the hybrid design that would create the most amount of benefit between all three. And then in that situation, you wouldn't have to do drip irrigation. You could just do that repository below, but you can think of it this way, especially when you're taking a look at dollars and cents being invested. If you're thinking of being in your, your site for a long time, um, then it makes perfect sense to invest that. If you're thinking about being it for a short time to do one or two, to get your sense of it and to know how to create it and manage it is really useful. One of the things that's become very apparent to me over the years is when we start something new, be it permaculture or growing our own food or starting to get into herbals if we start making tinctures or making salves or we start doing 
propagation, or we're just trying to feed our family, we have a huge uh, ignorance debt and we have a huge time debt. We have to pay those both down. So generally when I'm in a new place or a new situation, or I have new concepts, I try to have a little experiment with that situation. So I, I reduce the ignorance debt and I reduce a bit of the time debt. So I have, if I ever need to use that idea again, I've got some experience behind my belt. Excuse me. So I could see a little experiment in you know year one or year two, where you put in an example of each, you monitor, you see how much time, you track how much time you're putting into each one, which one seems to be better, and at least control the soil between the three, um, control the wood if you put two in one and, and, one and not in another, and then just be conscientious of how much water you're using um, if you do drip as opposed to doing wicking beds. The other great thing is wicking beds take a roughly 50 to 60% of what you usually use in drip because they are so conservative and because the, the soil is basically using what it needs as it comes up. There, like when you're growing, say, annual vegetables, sort of a depth requirement for, so I've already acquired all of the materials that I need to build the beds. I, I'm actually awesome. using like bottomless galvanized, but I forget what it's called. You know, those like fancy looking expensive, um, it's got a special coating on it. So it's not supposed to okay. um, rust or anything like that. I splurged because it's wet here and I, you know, wanted more than a few years out of, out of the raised beds. Yeah. Um, so I think they're 18 inches deep. Okay. Yeah. So 18, um, 18 inches isn't, isn't terrible for veg, but it, it is going to, it is going to um, eat into what you can do for a reservoir depending on what you want to grow. So right. if you want to grow carrots, you're going to need the full 18 inches. Uh, if you're growing okay. radishes, you're going to need about half of that. If you're growing potatoes, you're going to need at least that, if not double that. If you're growing okay. lettuces, no problem. If you're growing kales, no, like your brassicas, your, your lettuces, all of that, no problem in terms of that depth. So if you're working with that depth, then hookah cultures are in, I would say wicking beds are out. Um, and you probably have to supplement with some drip irrigation. Okay. All right. Yeah. That was the, the other thing I was thinking like for, I, I would have to figure out some sort of liner, right? If I'm, if yeah, doing well, good. no, if they're galvanized, right. But the, oh, but the bottom there, it's just a shell. There's no base. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's just, it's just sides. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I technically could go deeper. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because there's, there's no bottom on them. Yeah. So I guess the other thing is, is if you wanted to kind of play with it is you could, you could kind of do both and you could put one on top of the other. You could put a liner in the bottom. You could put your razors in and then you could put down the expanded metal lath that holds the soil. Yeah, you could, but you know, generally you're, you're trying to make something that, that isn't really meant for that type of, you know, just, it, it's like a big border. It's like a galvanized steel border, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say in that situation, um, well, you could also double them, right? Like you could put one on top of the other. So if you were looking at doing potatoes and carrots and things of that nature, you could raise them up. And, and this is why a lot of people go with wood only because you can do another course when you need to, right? Yeah. You can always move up, but you could do the same thing with the metal. And then what I would do is I would just take uh, what's called um, line. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on line post. So chain link line post. So there's corner post and line post in chain link. Line post is interior dimension is I think one and seven eighths because the top post fits into it if you're making hoop houses. But with that line post, you could then create anchor points that you could drive into the soil. And then that would hold your next course. So if you if you took that and put it on top, you would have something rigid internally, which is better than external, uh, because it would it would self hold. And if you did like one, two, three, four, it'd be perfect. And then it would hold it in. And then the other great thing about doing that: what are these shapes? Are they oval or are they sort of kind of rounded on the corners? Oh, I can't hear you, Sheena. I can't hear you. Sorry. You're, you're muted. <laughs> Everything has a rounded corner. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but are they oval in shape or are they like 
like this and then they curve and then they yeah. curve. Okay. Yeah, like that. They're actually, um, you know, when you buy them, they come with like 16 panels. And so you can make the beds into different shapes. So you could do oval oh. beds or sorry, circular beds, or you can do like L-shaped beds. Oh, that's um, cool. Which was, yeah. I mean, in my previous conversations with you, you know that I like things to look like neat and tidy, <laughs> yeah, totally. um, which is why I've opted to do like above ground raised beds. Yeah, totally. um, um, but yeah, they're, they're really neat, but I ha I'm just sort of getting started on it. It's a, it's a big project. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, it totally is. And I'm just, um, I'm pulling up my other, just want to stop the video so we don't get the nostril cam here. Okay. So I'm going to show you a little bit about why I think this might be um, a valuable way to go about this. So I'm just going to share my screen, get rid of those. Uh, share content, share screen. And I'll just ask everybody else to mute themselves. Because as much as Rose family's calling is good, I don't know if it's going to be positive for our conversation. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to pop the stand here. So one of the things that you could do, and this has worked really well for, for a number of years, so I'm just going to use squares as an example, but let's say this is a plan view and um, you put one on top of the other and we do this whole idea of putting in, um, uh, there we go. So I'm going to copy that a bunch. So if you end up, I don't want that at all. So if you end up putting in these little uh, line posts, so again, this is a plan view. The, uh, the square is your galvanized um, area. So if you end up, uh, let's see if I can do this. Nice. So if you end up doing it this way, what's brilliant about this is that it's really easy to turn your raised beds into greenhouses. And this is super useful for anybody who lives yes. in the temperate climate. Um, the way this ends up working is you end up having your bed like so, and then you've got your pipes those pipes of course are coming down and then what you can do put this on a new layer is you can then put in like pvc quarter inch and what's great about this is that it basically goes down into here and if you make it the full length so if you have it come all the way down you can then raise those up as the growing season goes on and you can actually have full coverage. The other great thing is that you can use this with then plastic. And the way that I do this is um, grab a piece of rope, tie it to the end, wrap it around, wrap it around, wrap it around. So this creates a ridge pole. Oh, and I would also put one at the end for sure. Wrap it around and come down. And then I can uh, put plastic over this entire, you can do this differently. Then I could put plastic over this entire area like so. Um, and the great thing about this is if you're looking at doing season extension, if you're looking at growing into the winter, uh, into the fall or into the spring, this is what I do with my carrots. So I do this in ground, but uh, for you, you can do it above ground. But basically I, I seed all my carrots in like May, June, and then I'm thinning them as I'm eating throughout the year. And then I throw on this plastic before the rains of fall. And the great thing is, is that your carrots will keep in ground as long as they don't get wet and then freeze and then have their, their cell membranes exposed. So I was eating carrots all through the winter, taking off a foot of snow, pulling it back, pulling out the carrots I needed. So this can be a great adaptation for your bed designs that uh, allow you to have a little bit of a greenhouse element to them as well. It also allows you to start seeds early. And then the other thing you can do um, is if you start like a, a second or a winter crop of spinach or even kale into like June, July, you can have a little bit of eating throughout the winter, but it starts you off really early in the spring because it's already there. It's just gone dormant. And so that'll take off and that can be one of your first crops into the spring. So this can be a, a nice way to put the design in if it's of interest. Jevin, can you hear me? Uh, I can, Daniel. Yeah, um, I really like this. Um, I um, am planning on using for um, uh, the um, annual garden 
a race bed. One, we have contaminated soils, which we've talked about, and that takes care of that completely. One thing that I saw, and I haven't built mine yet, but um, which I thought was really kind of interesting idea, I, uh, where you're talking about putting the um, beds in series, so you can water mm -hmm. them all at once. And that is the person had a um, pipe that he could move up or down on the connecting. So we had a little um, on, so whatever bed, so we could raise that up. And then that would um, bring this, the amount of water in that particular bed up until it reached the level of that pipe. Mm -hmm. So so the pipe, and then you could also put it down and it would drain it if you, if you had um, certain vegetables you didn't want the water level as high. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Basically, if you're if you build your your wicking beds all the same size and all the same shape, um, and you have a static fill line and they're all plumbed together, you don't have to worry about that. You'll usually put in an outflow on one of these, and that mm -hmm. outflow will hold the level so that way you don't oversaturate. But basically, as long as you have water that's touching those wicks, that water through capillary action, which is adhesion and cohesion together, will wick up into those areas and keep what's called field capacity for your soils. And that's what we're always aiming for. We're always aiming for field capacity. So I don't necessarily know why you would do that because that water won't ever saturate. The only time you have okay. saturated uh, beds is if you overwater and there's no way for that water to drain out. But in Sheena's okay. case, if she ends up using imported soil, and even if there's a big rain and a big deluge, basically if that water gets to field capacity and also has the ability to drain out through the bottom and then has an overspout, you're never going to get to a saturated bed. So I, I don't really know when or why you would do that because the, the soil itself holds itself at field capacity if it's a static amount of soil if it's built into or if it's if it's a part of a ground structure and you have hard pans or you have um soil texture interface problems where it's like first you have sandy and then you have clay and then you have bedrock yeah that can be a problem because you basically have a hard limit and that water can't saturate and this happens a lot with uh, clay soils but in sheena's situation because she has such sand sandy sandy soils um, and because she's importing the soil that she would be putting into the beds, I don't really think that would be necessary. Okay. The other thing is I was looking at, um, you know, we're, I, I guess they call them glass houses where they're just having- Yeah, Daniel, um, let's let's just complete on this. I just want to check in with Sheena and see if okay. she's good on this, and then we'll go to your next question. Thanks. Sheena, um, does, that, does that answer the question in terms of like how you would put an extra level on and then what the value could be if you put in those line posts in? Yeah, I've actually, I've done the hoop house before. Okay, um, good. Yeah, I usually, I do it more for pest control, but um, I am hoping to do it for to, for greenhouse use. Um, that'll be new for me. Um, and then, yeah, I am going to explore this wicking bed a little more. Um, okay. I'll do that off offline. Um, but yeah, because I do have to figure out how to irrigate all of this. Okay, awesome. If if you end up taking a look at the videos on the YouTube channel, if you could copy them into the resource section of our notes, I'm sure uh, other folks would be would be keen on that. Cool. Okay, Daniel, what was your question about glass houses? Yeah, it was very similar. I really liked your um, hoop house idea, and um, but what I was looking at building mine, um, it would be rubber lined, and then. I, but on a four by eight dimension, so I could get some of the, what do they call it? it looks like cardboard, but it's actually for the greenhouses. You know, oh, that, the, uh, the, the, chlor the chloroplast for sheeting? Right. But it literally could put one over the top of that. My thought is using that just because now you have kind of a glass house for getting your seating started. Oh, you? yeah. 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 They're called cold frames. And so this has been used for a long time and usually they're angled towards sort of that uh, equinox solar aspect. So basically yeah. you're, you're, you're finding the equinox solar aspect and generally you're putting the glass perpendicular to that. So whatever it is, like for us, it was 18 in the winter, it was 78 in the summer and I think it was around 42. So basically you would pitch the glass to be at that angle. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no worries. Awesome. Uh, any other questions from anybody or thoughts about design or does anybody want to pass some design conversations with such a small group? We can kind of direct as we need to. I'll go back and see if anybody has put any um, questions.
questions into the doc, but I don't think there has been. Can I just ask directly? Hey, Woder, yeah, ask directly, Hi. go for it. Uh, so this idea with the pipes, um, I do like this, um, but for a different reason, because um, uh, I've, I think I mentioned before that we have, um, we're surrounded by a nature reserve and we have uh, baboons coming into the town. And um, so we, we're having to find ways to protect crops because they're pretty indiscriminate with what they um, pull up. And they also are very smart. So, um, uh, so I, 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 I was, I was kind of, um, I was a bit disappointed by of the idea of like setting up a massive cage, but the idea of actually, um, over like erecting a cage, like just over the raised beds, would also maybe minimize the amount of materials you'd have to use. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the one thing I'm not sure of though, is how do you protect trees, um, without erecting a, a big structure or, or guarding or guarding just constantly. Yeah. So a couple of thoughts there. So I'll start here. Um, this was a design that we put together because there was a, an open garden that couldn't be fenced in. And, uh, there was a fair amount of deer. There was a high amount of deer pressure. And so what we ended up doing is we created this, this box that had a hinged lid. And so this hinge had, um, I think these were like two by fours. And then this was rebar. And I think we were using something super light that just held form. So I think it might've been quarter inch. Um, and then we had a, a piece of rebar as a, uh, this top piece, because you always need to have a ridge pole. And then what we did is we we placed on this um, some some metal lath or some uh, some sheeting that basically ran the entire length of this and wrapped around. Uh, and so what you had was this uh, hinged at the back. And so this whole structure could be opened. Uh, this could be opened and this could be closed. And so you could open it up you could work on it all day and when you were when you were totally done gardening you could lock them you could basically lock these garden beds um which worked really well so i would say you could use the same concept same conversation and you could either have pre-established areas because i had a colleague who was in was it south africa or lesotho one, one of the two um, and they, they wanted to do it this way and they ended up using plastic, but they found that the baboons would, uh, and the chimps would actually rip open the plastic and get in. So we, I ended up passing on this design and it worked really well. Um, for trees, uh, there's, there's kind of only two situations I've seen work. Um, one is doing an entire enclosure and then doing netting over top of everything. So that way they can't get in or netting the trees themselves or, having guard dogs. So three things. Um, the guard dogs definitely were keeping away the baboons and pro it's probably the cheapest and easiest, but has maintenance to it because it's a it's a working animal that you have to, to interact with and work with. Um, but with the, the fencing situation or the, the cages, cages for single trees, you're basically setting up a cage for each individual tree, which for this client, it made sense. And then the other one did a full cage and then uh, they ended up because the baboons were picking apart the cage. Uh, they went with my initial suggestion, which was just just get a couple of working dogs that are just there to patrol their outside dogs, and they're there to chase away the baboons. So those are uh, chimps in that situation. So those were the three situations we found. Okay, um, I mean, I, I've I've also had conversations with um, uh, people who've actually worked with. Um, communities in in mozambique and um the people there live right next to wildlife you know they're dealing with elephants and bush pigs and you know baboons monkeys so um they actually they actually move into their fields for five months during the growing season and, and they actually protect their their food for for five months uh but obviously that's not going to be feasible for me um 
Yeah, but um, if you also if you kept the trees, if you keep, I, I'm not planning to. I don't really want my fruiting trees to get too big. Um, so that would also allow you to kind of minimize the uh, the amount of work. Yeah, hundred percent, and that's that for me is a given. So I tend to keep my trees at a pedestrian level, which means that I can reach anything within them, and I'm I'm not tall. I'm five ten, so. I'm trying to keep them at like six and a half feet max. The place I just moved into has let their trees go for what seems to be years. And so I'm pruning them back down so that way they can be pedestrian. So that way I can reach them. Um, and generally this works out really well. There's a French pruning technique uh, called the French method. And basically what it is, is you're, you can take a look at Stefan Stobanowski's work. Um, uh, Miracle Orchard out of Quebec, Canada. And basically he he weights down the branches of his trees. And what happens is when a tree has um, a branch that's above horizontal, above zero degrees, um, that tree generally is, is going to produce a little bit of fruit and it's mostly going to produce a lot of vegetation. When a tree gets zero, zero degrees or minus zero degrees, what happens is the tree sends what's called an auxin, an A-U-X-I-N, auxin, which is the communication hormone of a tree. And it sends it down to the crown, which is the brain of the tree where the trunk becomes the roots. It says, hey, we're dying. We need to create fruit because the only time uh, that a tree <laughs> branches kind of get that low is when they're falling over. And so it sends this life uh, emergency response to the tree. It goes, let's produce more fruit. So typically what will happen is that these French cultivators would weigh down the top of the branch, literally with weights or rocks or tie them off. And they would get a huge fruiting spur off of them, just phenomenally huge. And funny enough, I just had a tree out back that um, the the branch was was pretty laden, but then broke and then produced even more because it was still connected uh, to the cambium. So it produced more. So I would say, yeah, keep your trees small. And then it's actually relatively easy to create little, um, little uh, cages for them that you can create out of two by fours or line pole or pole wood or, you know, you name it. And then you just have to worry about the netting. Right. Yeah. And, and the, the other consideration I had was, was actually um, trying to incorporate the uh, whatever structure you want to build, maybe incorporating into the, into the design so that it can actually be a feature of the design and not like, not just a kind of protective measure. Yeah, that's a great point. And this is where sometimes if you're using caging, it can become trellising on the opposite side of where the sun is. So, you know, if you're in the Southern hemisphere, this will be on the North, Northern hemisphere on the South. But, you know, if you have this tree, um, you can do some vining potentially on the back side of this tree. Uh, it could be a great way to integrate more vertical growing space for some vines or some uh, for some perennial vines or some annual vines. Um, the other thing is to become uh, an officiato of of cages and of fencing. And so this is something really beautiful that you can see throughout antiquity, uh, especially in sort of the uh, the Victorian gardens of, of of England. There was a lot of effort put into these fences and into these poles and even the uh, the round pole wood work of Ben Laud of the UK it's really about taking the time and creating a cage that looks beautiful and is aesthetically pleasing and potentially even if you're using larger diameter wood be it pole wood or be it um, square wood and then entering into it like uh, native pollinator habitat doing like mason bee or native bee habitat or things of that nature or creating um, posts to then put bird boxes onto or bat boxes uh, bat boxes are brilliant for for bringing in um, insect um, reduction so if you are dealing with a larger amount of insects you bring in more bat boxes more bat boxes bring in more bats bats eats insects drops insects so yeah there's lots of functionality once you get into those cages to integrate it more within the the larger scope of the design it's a great point any other thoughts about that or any other questions i just wanted to say kudos to you because that just makes the deer and the bunnies seem so minor by comparison. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. And it's, it's one of the great things about this course is we have so many international students and we get a chance to speak and talk that we, we get that appreciation. Um, I was working with a colleague who was dealing with, uh, with uh, chimps again in Lesotho. And uh, when I told him about some of the bear issues we had, he, he similarly had an experience like, I'll take chimps any day over something that can actually eat me. So there's, there's always going to be some sort of risk. That's for sure. Any follow-up questions for you, Walter? Um, uh, yeah, I guess I can ask a question about um, soil, um, since we're doing that at the moment. Um, I, I found that my soil is um, really free-draining at the moment. Um, uh, and I guess... Um, uh, in terms of like growing annual vegetables, it, it doesn't really seem feasible to 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 do in ground beds unless I'm going to put a lot of organic matter in in the soil. Um, I don't know. Do it, would, would you would you kind of just suggest going the route of growth beds in that situation? Yeah. So um to increase organic matter or not to increase organic matter that's the question um generally i tend to do both so if i can increase organic matter within my soil and this is what will happen over time so if you have this i i shouldn't have stopped broadcasting i should have continued it but um if you end up having a raised bed above an area that is poor soil the area around the poor, the poor so or the 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 soil below the raised bed will increase in its organic matter due to bioturbation. So you'll have things like microarthropods and earthworms, and basically they'll start to move the soil that you've put into the raised bed. If it isn't, of course, a wicking bed, um, they'll start to interact. They'll start to change and move around because they're starting to increase. The water holding capacity they're looking for food they're starting to create more space to to breed and grow and all the rest of it and so generally my approach to this is it's it's valuable to increase water holding capacity it's valuable to increase carbon it's valuable to increase total biological activity for all of my soil the limiting factor is time and money so if i don't have the time and money i will prioritize raised beds because that will prioritize food production and that will put more food into my larder, into my family and create more, more food security. Because for me, looking globally, what we're looking at, be it supply chain issues, global shipping, advents of war, advents of civil unrest, I think everyone needs to be hyper-concerned about local sovereignty when it comes to food. So that's kind of my process. If I have a little bit of extra time, um, or let's say I don't have the materials to work on a raised bed. I will bring in materials to increase the, the soil fertility and I'll just create gardens in ground because generally in ground gardens are going to be of higher efficiency, higher fertility long-term. So if I can do some lasagna gardening, if I can throw down some newspapers and cardboard and bring in a whole bunch of uh, composted horse manure, I'll do that because that for me has a higher value because the water holding capacity of that soil is always going to be more than the water holding capacity of a limited uh, um, volume of raised bed. So typically what I try to do is I try to create a lot of garden space and then fence off that garden space because just long-term it has better water holding capacity. If, if I don't, then I'll do the raised beds. And then outside of that, what I'll do is things like cover crops, or I'll do uh, aerated compost extracts and teas, and I'll do broadcasting with that with a backpack sprayer or you know just a watering can to to put over top of that different ground. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll slowly convert different areas of ground. So I'll do long. Come here. You're good. Thank you. I'll do uh, larger hookah cultures that over time will slowly start to decompose. And again, they'll be, they'll create these little, um, think of them like coral reefs, 
you know, if you have a hookah culture, the area around it will slowly start to become uh, a higher water holding capacity, a higher um, organic matter, more organic life. So it really just depends on what your resources are in terms of time and money. And going back to Sheena's conversation, really start, if this is new to you, start with nucleated design. Start with a small concept that you put in, you monitor, you see how it works, you build the skills to work with it, and then you can go out. But if I had the time and money, I would absolutely invest in the materials to create a compost uh, brewer. Uh, so I use a Eco Plus number five for use with a 45 gallon drum. If I was using an IBC tote, I would go up to the seven. These are pumps that pump air. They don't pump water. And then the fittings and everything else to basically pump air through a, a volume of water that is non-chlorinated, non-chloramated. So basically you wanna make sure that this isn't treated water because if it's treated, it's not going to be able to support life. And then basically grab great compost or good soil from your area, put it into a firm netted bag, not not a, a pantyhose stocking and things like that. What happens if you use pantyhose or things right, that just, are loose? I'm seeing even the Excuse door, me. sorry. Okay. Um, I've got my wife out, sorry. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Lots of distractions today. Yeah, but uh, basically for every, everybody else who's on and everybody else who's watching this after the fact, it's really just about resources. You know, ideally you want your entire property to be, um, to be of the highest quality soil, but it, it'll always come down to resources. So I would, uh, for you odor, I would focus on whatever's close to the house. I would focus on the areas that you're going to work on in terms of trees. And again, if your soil is poor and this, this goes for Sheena as well, if your soil is poor and you don't want to do the hoog culture, or maybe this is an addition, you can start different areas that will decompose in a year that you're going to plant a tree into in a year. And so we've done this many times where if we know we're planting out an orchard and the soil is poor or terrible, we'll dig holes specifically for trees, we'll line them with organic matter, we'll let those decompose, and then we'll plant the trees in the following year or the year afterwards. So that could be a great way for your voter or Sheena or anybody else to um, develop areas that you're going to plant a tree into that can help to sustain that tree long term. And for those for those sort of um, in situ composting areas, I highly recommend fish. Uh, if you can get extra fish heads from the local um, fishmonger, anything that has that higher nutrient value that you don't want above ground decomposing, but you can throw underground and it'll decompose over the year and you don't have to smell it once. It's brilliant. I'll do that if I have it. Um, planting trees so if i'm planting a tree i'll throw a couple of fish heads in the, the bottom of it and whatever else i have and then plant the tree on top of it and what's amazing we did this once um in victoria or just near victoria it was a big project uh done by a colleague of mine named mark and uh we put like two or three fish heads or sometimes half a fish head underneath all these blueberry bushes and year one they were okay and year two they were okay and then they found the fish heads and it was explosive there were blueberries bigger than my thumb. You know, they were the size of blackberries because they had so much nutrition. And that nutrition, I should have checked in with Mark. I think it, I knew it carried him, carried the blueberries into year four and they needed no supplementary uh, fertility after that. But that's a great way to like create that fertility, develop it in situ, build up that organic matter, especially if you get like a huge haul of organic matter, um, be it you know, uh, uh, manures or fish heads or uh, brewers excess or any like that, and then build up a small repository of fertility it could be really great to do it that way. Did that answer your question, Motor? I was kind of all over the place with that one. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's, I don't, I don't think my, my soil is that terrible, really. It's, um, uh, it just, ha it just happens to be very well draining, um, but it does, um, I think it it could need it could use a little bit more organic matter. So, mm -hmm. um, I I just I I do I do tend to favor the um the raised bed route because it's a little easier on your back. <laughs> but, uh, but I I I do kind of want to do a combination of the two where you you can have kind of in ground stuff around raised beds and then you could kind of do a mixed approach. Yeah. But um, yeah, that that answers the question. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. And if you're worried about backs, um, 
I'm a huge fan of a 30 inch bed. So this, this will be an argument for anybody who has to spend money on materials, but I really don't like a four foot bed. I find that if I'm leaning over 24 inches, um, you know, my, my low back starts to get me. So I do keep my beds actually quite small just for my back. If I am going to put the, the energy and time into it, I do keep it quite small. The other thing I would say is that if the soil just needs a little bit more organic matter, um, and if you're going to go into knowing the size and the shape, I just remembered your, your site here, um, you know, compost that you can till into the top two to six inches is a, is a great addition. Um, on top of that, if you can do some cover crops or, and this is a great way actually for Sheena and anybody else who's dealing with either, this is great for super compacted soils and super well-draining soils. If you can scatter things like parsnip or daikon radish throughout the lawn and allow them to grow, what'll happen is they'll become these little repositories of sugar that'll attract, um, soil, uh, biology and what you'll have is if you do that year after year because the seed is cheap for parsnip and for things like daikon what will happen is year after year that'll create a slow road to increasing water holding capacity and other biologicals in the soil that don't take a lot of time at all so there's some there's some like easy things to do and there's some more intensive things to do with machinery but that could be a great way if you're working with highly compacted or super draining soils just to increase the amount of organic matter into your soils Thank you for the idea of the composting in place, because that's definitely something that we can start now. And I would never even have thought to do, do something like that. Generally, if you're going to plant a tree, let's say we really want to plant persimmon. So oh, we nice. want to plant persimmon tree. Um, how big of an area do you think you would start like in terms of filling? Yeah. Yeah. Hole? So, so, so generally depending on the tree size, um, your, your, your depth of your tree Pardon me. The depth of the hole you create is usually the size of the root, um, plus like a little bit, not much. And then usually it's twice as wide. So if you're if you're looking at trees, basically go to the garden center, get a sense of, yeah, I think we're going to buy year one trees, year two, year three, year four. Just get a sense of those sizing and then basically create that hole in that shape with a little bit extra, like an inch or two, and then do your fill. Uh, and generally you want to leave on top, you want to have at least six to 12 inches and usually mounded six to 12. And the reason for that, again, things are going to decompose and compress. And so if you create a, uh, if you create, uh, you know, level ground within these um, composting in situ areas, what will happen is you'll get a depression. And if you're in a place with low rainfall, perfect. But if you're in a place of high rainfall, this can oversaturate the compost. And now you've created what's called an anaerobic environment or without oxygen. And this is a problem. This won't create the, the decomposition we want because decomposition needs air. This will create an aquatic anaerobic environment. And then this decomposition will be um, spotty at best. And you may have to go back in with a shovel you may have to like mix it up. So generally I try to keep things light and airy at the bottom. I try to put like sticks and branches down there. So there's a little bit of air and I'll do that sort of in pockets as I go up. Um, sometimes I'll use uh, a, a course of, um, of leaves or I'll mix leaves in just so that way there is a little bit of interstitial airspace because if that does compress and gets super gnarly, um, that'll create uh, a lot of, uh, it can't even create alcohols, which are problematic because alcohols are a biocide. Um, as we all know, after we've had a night of drinking, our stomach and our brain are not happy with us. It'll wipe out our gut flora. So similarly for plants and for, for biology, alcohol is a, a biocide. So it's just important if you're going to create those things for a tree, make sure it's the, 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 the hole is the depth of the root ball plus a little bit and then double that wide. And then just a little bit more if you're going to do this thing uh, where you're doing in-situ composting. Um, and then again, six to 12 inches on top and mounded. So you want a, you know six to 12 inches proud so that way it'll settle down where you need it. Good question. All right. Any any last burning question before we end off? 
Yeah, I have a couple of questions on the back to the wiki embeds. Um, I'm also doing some verma composting. And um, my question is on that is if I have a wiki embed, I'm in zone five, maybe closer to between five and six, probably would be a 5B. Um, it's going to freeze all the way through, right? The raised beds. Yeah, chances are you're going to get a fair amount of freezing around the edges, and the core is going to stay um, unfrozen if you're in a five. Okay, so I could put some. Can I put, um, in effect, um, vermicompost in in place on these in these wicking beds? Oh, like use the wicking beds for for adding in your scraps and then having the worms work on them. Well, yeah, adding some scraps in, but also putting some of the um, worm compost in there but didn't put some worms in there as well. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And that's definitely something you should do. Yeah, whenever you can take okay. high grade castings or um, vermicomposting uh, ex exudate fluids. So the, the liquid that comes off of it, absolutely a hundred percent. The one thing I would be conscientious about is if you were going to do vermicomposting, you were gonna do it outside and you're in Idaho, is that right? Or Montana? Yeah, Northern Idaho. Northern Idaho. Yes. Um, I would likely have one or two beds because you're not going to support a huge population of vermicomposting off of a, a small family. I would probably just have a bed that I would use for vermicomposting and I would probably insulate it with rigid styrofoam is what I would do. Oh, yeah. Would it then, make sense? Would it make sense to put the styrofoam in, in my situation, put this styrofoam inside the, um, the, um, raised bed the the wicking beds just just for just for vegetables and things like that yeah no mainly i don't the, think so no what will okay. end up happening is you'll have a problem with barrier interference and oh, okay. the problem with rigid styrofoam is that uh microbiology and also macrobiology will start to eat at it and it'll incorporate it into the soil and so oh. you'd be in a situation where you'd have to line it and now you're questioning what the liner is so you know i i don't know if i would do that Okay. Um, especially for a raised bed. And now you get into the whole situation where you have to put in a lot for a vegetable and then like, what's the value of the vegetable and what's okay. the embodied energy of the, the, the okay. bed. You know, if, if, if there was ever, like, if you're ever close to a SIP panel, uh, these are structural, uh, structural insulated panels mm -hmm. and they had off cuts. Sure. You know, like great material, structurally sound, it's rigid. Perfect. Because one of the main problems with raised beds, and Sheena, you may actually be dealing with this. I'm glad I thought about this. Um, usually, whatever you use, especially if it's if it's preformed, but even if it's wood, it'll bow out in the middle, especially if you're doing long runs. And so usually we use threaded ties that run through the entire, it's just like a threaded rod and then big washers on the end that create that rigidity. And usually it's like, what was it, every two feet? two to three feet, I think is what it was. Um, if you're using thin material like gauge, or if you're using, we once did 16 foot raised beds with four by fours. And we found that every four feet, we had to put a tie rod in basically to hold it together because it, it bowed out. Um, so going back to your question there, Daniel, um, that's the other issue is that you can, you can, you, you have to be conscientious about that because it'll bow out. So yeah, I would say don't worry about it for veg, but uh, okay. for vermicompost, a hundred percent and better yet, if you can, you know, sink, um, sink that down into the ground. I had a colleague of mine, uh, Gord Baird, eco-sense.ca, and he created a verma, uh, gray water verma composting filter for his gray water. So his gray water would come in, go through a series of vertical filters, pardon me, go in and all of the material that came out of the sink would go into this amazing bed of worms. The worms would basically eat everything that was in the sink. And they were very conscientious not to pour anything down the sink that was not biocompatible. And then it would go through these vertical filters and then go through a, a stand filter to the point to where it was so filtered, it would then be able to run through their drip irrigation. But my Didn't point here- Can you repeat that site again? Eco-sense.ca, eco dash S E N C E dot C A. Um, he had to sink it down into the ground and he was in Victoria, which is seven a. So one of the things I've learned 
especially with worms, is you do need to insulate them quite well. And so probably what I would do if I was doing an outdoor vermicompost in your situation is I'd build the box and then I would line the outside with straw bales. That's probably what I would do. And then do an insulated lid, something like that. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, what I'm doing right now with them is I take them inside the house, um, which my wife's not too excited about, but um, <laughs> I have um, 18 gallon totes that I'm, I'm, I'm okay. composting in. But sure. I would like to increase this and this would be really good because I hadn't figured it out on. Yeah, and that's the other option. You know, you can, you can bring them in for the winter and the, what was it called? The worm machine. I think that was the, it was the square one that if managed properly had zero smell when I was working with it, which was brilliant. Um, the big problem is smell. You know, if you're living in, and being with other people, the big problem is smell. And then what do you do with the worm juice when it comes off? But if you're in the winter, you could just throw it into a old milk jug and throw it outside and let it freeze and leave a little head space at the top and then it's ready for the spring. So lots of options. Okay, so back on the vermicomposting, how much do you and how much would you incorporate and how would you incorporate it into the... Oh, oh yeah, okay, good question. Um, so generally what I did with hookah cultures is I would take like like a handful of worms and I would put them into the bed, usually the top third and like every couple of feet, I would put this colony. And the reason why I did a colony and, and didn't sprinkle them as if I was putting in like Gaia green or something is that worms like to be together and they need this little space to be, you know, have a little colony. So I wouldn't sprinkle them. I'd put like a ball of it. Um, and I would do the same thing with a raised bed. I would put in a ball and I would let them move throughout and find their own way. Because generally when we have biology and it comes together, um, it likes being together. So let's not, let's not break that up. Let's not spread that out. So I would generally take a ball and it, let's say we we're doing a four foot by eight foot um, bed. I'd probably put one, two, kind of one in each half, um, at least six inches down, if not a little deeper. And uh, yeah, just, just treat it as the living organism it is, you know, gently put it in, put the soil around it and then uh, let it start to interact with the vegetables you grow. Just make sure that there's there's a fair bit of mulch there uh, just to give them uh, some insulation and a little bit of food. Okay. Perfect. I do have one on a different comp. Uh, can I ask one more question? On yeah, one subject? more and then we gotta go. Okay, um, raised, um, um, for raised beds, we have a um, fiberglass manufacturer nearby and you can get the ends and like, so you can get like a 10 inch or 10 foot wide, six foot wide, different sizes, round cylinder. That would be, you know, that you could cut off a couple of feet high. Is there any issues that you're aware of with fiberglass as far as? I don't know personally of any issues. Um, is it a sealed fiberglass or is it like a, a, a bird finish where you kind of have little fiber sticking out? No, it's sealed. It's it, what it is is oh, they'll be yeah. they'll be um like a ten foot um wide or six foot wide or whatever four foot wide uh, cylinders. They'll be like 20, 20 feet and they'll cut off the ends. Oh, cool. Um, and and they'll be like up to three eighths to a half inch thickness. Oh, cool, cool. Uh, I would just ask them what their sealing process is, and if it's heat sealing, you're fine. Uh, if they're using a chemical, I would I would just find out what the chemical is and then take a look at the, uh, I've forgotten the name, MDS sheet. Um, just take a look at the MDS sheet and get a sense of what it is and and if there's any uh, issues with with biology. And if there is, that's a whole other conversation. Then, you, then you're looking at a way to seal it. Um, and again, all, seal, all sealings, all linings eventually, eventually give way. So... Yeah, just be conscientious about that, about what you're potentially introducing into your food and into your soil. Because if it's in the soil, it'll be in the food, especially annuals. The great thing about um, woody deciduous is that uh, woody deciduous, the stem will usually take up the majority of the contaminants. So if you have contaminated soil or issues, it'll usually be in the stem. And so if you're doing fruit, if you're doing um, nuts, usually it's not going to transfer in. If you're doing herbaceous, if you're doing lettuces, if you're doing definitely potatoes and root crops, it will get into the the vegetable. So yeah, just be conscientious about that. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. 
Well, look at that, Sheena. We thought we uh, we weren't even going to have a session. <laughs> um, huge pleasure to see all you fine folks after the break. Thanks so much for, for stopping in. Um, as usual, any questions or comments or queries, feel free to uh, send my way. Um, there's a bunch of great courses that I'm hosting and collaborating on with Regenerative Living, including Coppice Agroforestry, which is cutting trees and having them come again um, with uh, Mark Krawcheck. We have an amazing course that we just launched for pre-launch called Propagating Woody Edibles. So if you want to learn how to propagate all of these um, trees and shrubs in the temperate climate, phenomenal course coming up. It's on pre-launch. I'll make sure it's in the in the uh, in the document. Um, and we have a rainwater harvesting course with Gord Baird, who's an international rainwater designer. He's designed and installed more than 30 different systems at small scale and large scale. Um, I just had the pleasure of going through the composting toilets course with Gord, and we, we used to be good friends and, and live near each other. And it's cool when you, when you kind of exit somebody's orbit and just see how much work they've done. The body of work that Gord has done with rainwater harvesting is I would say unparalleled in Western North America. He's just, he has an amazing command of the subject. So if you're looking to go deep on that, that's another amazing course. And then last but not least, I ran a Envision 2023 course uh, right at the end of December. If you haven't had the process or haven't gone through the process of reviewing your previous year, envisioning what your next year will be and really getting a sense of what that is, it's uh, skill and process that I've done for years and just started to offer publicly the last three years when friends and colleagues were asking me. So brilliant course, super cheap. I think it's like 29 bucks. Um, well worth the time and effort if you're thinking about what's next. And I'll make sure all of those are in the uh, uh, in the notes document. For anybody who's watching on YouTube, I really hope I put them in the show notes. If I haven't, put a comment below and I'll put them back in. But thanks, folks. Uh, we're into the second half of the course. So make sure if you're um, behind to really get in your, your assignments, because all assignments are due on that final due date, whenever that is. I think it's May something. So just make sure to get all your assignments in, or else you'll need to think about re-enrolling or just not getting your certificate. So with that, thank you very much. And uh, it's been a pleasure. We'll see all you fine folks in the next one. Take care.